Good evening, and welcome to Georgia Southwestern State University. I'm Professor Bonnie Levine Berggren, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Global South Lecture. This lecture series is named after and endowed by the late Professor Emeritus, Harold Isaacs, who served as a history professor at Georgia Southwestern for 49 years. During his tenure at GSW, Professor Isaacs taught courses in Latin American history, African American history, and established minors in black studies and third world studies. In 1981, he launched the Third World in Perspective seminar series, and two years later, he established the Association of Third World Studies. In 1984, the Journal of Third World Studies followed. This journal addressed the problems and issues facing less developed countries all over the world. Following Professor Isaac's death in 2015, the name of the journal was changed to the Journal of Global South Studies and is now published by the University of Florida on behalf of the now named Association of Global South Studies. As part of his bequest to GSW, Professor Isaacs requested that part of his monies be used each semester to bring a guest speaker to campus to talk to our campus community about the issues and opportunities facing the Global South. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen Vasconcelos. A Fulbright Scholar and native of Miami, Dr. Vasconcelos graduated with her PhD in Atlantic Studies from Florida International University in 2004. She's a professor of history at the University of West Georgia. While her teaching focuses on Africana studies and the Atlantic world, her research centers on the history of enslaved girls and youth in 18th century Jamaica. Dr. Vasconcelos' first book, a co-edited volume with Jennifer Hillman Helgren, entitled Girlhood, A Global History, was published by Rutgers University in 2010. Her monograph, Slavery, Abolition, and Childhood in Jamaica, 1788 to 1838, was published by the University of Georgia Press in 2015. In addition to researching a project examining the changing nature of girlhood in the colonial Caribbean, Dr. Vasconcelos is also working on a project that examines the Yuli, Florida in antebellum Florida. Welcome. So thank you, wow. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, before I start, um, I want to thank Professor Bonnie Levine Bergeron uh, for inviting me to participate in this amazing lecture series. I spent some time on YouTube watching some of the past speakers, and I'm really honored to be included among them. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about these amazing girls who I've been researching for the better part of 20 years. Um, when I was thinking about this presentation on enslaved girlhood, I was trying to think about what I wanted to talk with you about today. And usually when we give presentations, we have maybe 15 or 20 minutes to talk about everything that we want to talk about. Um, and then we have two or three other people on a panel with us, but I have like a whole hour almost. So it's a luxury to have this amount of time. So really what I want to do is talk about the girls themselves as much as their girlhood and their experiences growing up enslaved in Jamaica. Um, children and youth traditionally find themselves on the fringes of historical discourse and source material for enslaved youth is, is elusive. Uh, children are part of an already marginalized group of people um, who are categorically depicted as victims and voiceless statistics. When enslaved girls are discussed, their stories are generalized alongside women's experiences or mere postscripts to that of their mothers. And so really they're sidelined and their experiences as part of the narrative are on the periphery despite the fact that they have a story that's very unique to that of their mothers, of their family, and of their kinship group. 
We really only have a few primary sources penned by survivors, male or female. Um, so the majority of our sources are from the planner's point of view. So it's very difficult to get their perspective of their experiences. Then when you add the complications of history and memory, the biases of abolitionists who help them publish their stories in their adulthood, um, gaps in documentation, environmental deterioration of centuries old sources, you realize that it's really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. That doesn't mean that you can't find them in the archives, and I've spent the last 20 years researching their life histories. If you look, you can begin to construct and characterize a picture of their girlhoods. However, that is one that's surrounded by brutality, harsh labor, and death. Their lives are not completely their own, and enslaved girls throughout the Atlantic world matured within an environment that defined their childhoods and their girlhoods as a means of production. Youth culture as a whole um, within the enslaved community is defined by a set of norms, values, and practices outside of those experienced by other youth of the period who grow up free. And these girls are growing up in an environment that refuses to protect them or even acknowledge their existence outside of being an economic investment. Still, we can construct a picture of a life outside of that exploitive environment in which they live, and we can find evidence that their values and practices prioritize survival. So that's what I want to talk with you about today. <clears throat> so... I want to introduce you to four girls. Um, I want you to think about them as we continue past their stories and I start talking in more generalized terms. First, there's Sally. In April of 1762, a planter named Thomas, Thomas Thistlewood purchased Sally, who was a young Congolese girl of about nine or 10 years of age, intending for her to work as a seamstress on his estate called Egypt in the parish of Westmoreland. He didn't say how long she had been on the island or in what condition she lived before she came to him, and I know he didn't care. I did my master's thesis on children's experiences in the transatlantic slave trade and past research on the Middle Passage and the horrors of that journey gives me an idea of what she went through before she got there. The fact that she survived that journey is monumental in itself. I knew that she was lucky to survive that and I could only imagine the fragile psyche that this young girl had after being ripped from her family and any environment that she knew. So basically it's like putting her on another planet. So I started imagining a girl who was scared, who was alone, and who was very innocent. As I started reading through Thistlewood's diaries, I realized that not only did I underestimate her, but so did Thistlewood. Not long after her purchase, he sent her to his master seamstress doll, who was supposed to teach her how to be an apprentice. Three years later, doll sends her back to Thistlewood and she basically told him off one side and down the other. He put Sally in the stocks for a week and he relegated her to the sugar fields. Her rebellious nature was so much that Doll couldn't control her and she sent her back. So Thistlewood said, if you can't handle this, I'll just stick you in the fields. At Egypt, Sally became quite the troublemaker, which was undoubtedly a response to her situation and frequent sexual attacks by Thistlewood. And she ran away with some degree of regularity with the first instance occurring one week after she was taken out of the stocks and put into the fields. <clears throat> she destroyed tools, property, she set fires, she stole food and rum. She was a force to be reckoned with and she was the bane of his existence. His diaries while he's sitting there talking about, I killed a spider today. Then he's talking about all the things that Sally did, and it's one entry after another, and she frequently appears with the different things that she's doing. No matter how many times he punished her, no matter how many times she went into the stocks, she kept doing it, she kept running away, and he just kept putting her back in the stocks, and it never ended. 
Sally was angry, absolutely incensed at the life that fate had given her, and she acted out consistently as a result. Her sail to Thistlewood was perhaps the worst place she could have gone. He was the epitome of sadism, and he took immense pleasure in torturing and punishing his enslaved population in horrific ways, and Sally was a favorite of his. Not only did she resist, she fought. And where he describes her as a violent juvenile delinquent, I see a girl who stole in order su to supplement her meager diet, who resisted sexual advances, and who fought. Unfortunately, her story is also one of a girl whose anger at her situation became so consuming that she became an alcoholic. And she was committing acts of self-harm, and we realized that these choices were also her ways of surviving. Eventually, her own community turned their back on her after she began taking her anger and depression out on them. By the time she was 30, her alcoholism, acts of theft, violence, running away, and self-destruction led to her transportation off of the island in November of 1784, and she was never seen again. Transportation basically means that he sells her. Usually they come here to Georgia. So I'm looking for her now, and I haven't been able to find her. I suspect they changed her name. So, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. Six years after Sally's purchase in Westmoreland in 1768, a four-year-old enslaved mulatto girl named Molly Matthews navigated the gauntlet known as the manumission process across the island in the parish of Clarendon. According to parish rectors, little Molly was the reputed daughter of an unnamed enslaved woman belonging to the Clarendon Rectory and a white man named David Matthews, who worked as an estate manager on a nearby sugar estate. <clears throat> Matthews himself submitted Molly's application for manumission. And he provided an enslaved woman in exchange for Molly's freedom because that was the requirement. So if you want to buy somebody's freedom, you need to replace them. Unfortunately for Matthews and his daughter, the parish rector stole Molly's replacement and left the parish before her manumission paperwork could be processed. The two were never seen again, and the Clarendon Vestry rescinded the order until Matthews could provide another enslaved person as a replacement. That never happened. He couldn't afford it. And Molly remained enslaved with her mother at the rectory. Thirty years later, a more sympathetic Clarendon vestry championed Molly's case, and they petitioned the Jamaican Assembly, which is the island government, for her freedom in November of 1794. I'm absolutely shocked that the Assembly manumitted Molly and her four children with very little debate. Not only did they manumit her with no debate, and it was nearly a unanimous vote, they didn't require replacements for her or her children. So, at the <clears throat> not long after the vote, the 30-year-old mother, 30 mother of four walked out of the Clarendon Rectory with her family to begin her life as a free woman of color. I've lost track of her after that, but I have a lead and I'm working on that. So I'm trying to construct her life after her freedom. In 1808, another nine-year-old girl named Molly began an apprenticeship as a laundress on Thetford Sugar Estate in the parish of St. John, having only spent two years laboring in the fields. This Molly was the daughter of an enslaved field laborer named Margareta and Thetford Estate's white bookkeeper, William Pengilly. We don't know the circumstances of her birth, but pieces of her life can be constructed by Thetford's archival records. There we see Molly entering Thetford's field gangs at the age of seven, two years past the normal age, only to leave two years later to apprentice under the enslaved domestics working in the great house. By 1821, she's now a washerwoman on Thetford. She's converted to Christianity, and she took the name Elizabeth Pengilly. While being rented out to a white man named William Thomas Fraser, she gave birth to four children who were listed as quadroon in the inventories, which means they were one quarter African descent. And they all took the last name Fraser. So I'm assuming he was the father because her, her I guess, ownership would have gone to the other estate. <clears throat> 
Fraser terminated the contract sometime between 1827 and 1829, so she returns to Thetford with her children. By 1832, she had given birth to two more daughters, christened Mary and Anne Booth, which are quite possibly the children of Thetford's bookkeeper, Edward Booth. Neither Fraser nor Booth provided for Elizabeth or their children. And Elizabeth spent her 30s navigating her family through the complicated transition from slavery to apprenticeship to eventual freedom in 1838. I'm working on constructing their post-emancipation histories now. And then there's 15-year-old Minetta, who we only meet in passing while reading Matthew Monk Lewis's well-known journal of a West Indian proprietor, which was published in 1834. In 1816, Minetta was brought before the Westmoreland Parish Courts for attempted murder. According to Lewis, Minetta added poison to some brandy, which was often mixed with water as a medicinal aid. So if you couldn't sleep or you had heart problems or something like that, they gave you brandy. According to Minetta, she argued that she had taken the brandy from the medicine chest at the directive of her grandmother. She said she didn't know that it was poisoned. Lewis, on the other hand, says that she's lying, and he describes a sociopath who coldly stood over her victim as he lay dying. Her testimony instead placed the blame on her grandmother, who she alleged told her to do this. She was transported off the island not long after being found guilty, and I have not seen her since. She probably came here. So to say that life histories like Sally's and Molly's and Elizabeth's are rare is an understatement. The fact that we have evidence of their childhood and their adulthood is almost unheard of. Their stories are exemplary of what many girls in their situation faced in Jamaica during this period, and it's not uncommon for girls of Sally's age to be given the opportunity to escape the fields and improve their station in life by learning a more skilled trade. In fact, Thistlewood purchased another girl named Akaba, also probably from the Republic of Congo, which isn't that then. Um, and she was sent to apprentice under Dahl, which was very successful, and she continued to work at Egypt in her adulthood. What we see in Hall Sally's heartbreaking story, though, is incredible agency from a girl who refused to settle for the path that she was forced to travel. And while she survived, her anger is one that consumed and nearly destroyed her. Elizabeth and Molly's status as domestics and girls of mixed ancestry set them apart from most of the enslaved community on the island. With the complex social and racial stat stratifications of the day being what they were, whiteness elevates the status of both enslaved and free people who are of mixed ancestry, while simultaneously diminishing their perceived labor potential. So there's a social hierarchy that comes with whiteness. And we see Elizabeth's status rise above her mother, and her children would have had a higher status than she would have. Therefore, in addition to having manumission opportunities that most enslaved children only dreamed of, children of color, as they were often called, received certain benefits from being a child of mixed parentage. So girls like Elizabeth and Molly, as well as their children and grandchildren, would have had access to finer clothing, a more nutritious diet, labor opportunities outside of the fields, and on rare occasions, even an education. Yet, direct connection to the white community does not always ensure manumission, which is what we saw with Molly. Children like Molly Matthews rarely, rarely had a champion, including the abolitionists who waxed poetic about freedom from across the ocean. While Molly was lucky to gain the support of the Clarendon Vestry in her adulthood, studies show that boys were acknowledged more by their fathers than girls. As a result, Elizabeth's experiences are more the norm, and they progress through their girlhoods without even a sliver of hope for freedom. And then there's Minetta, whose story reminds us that precise information about specific girls is largely anecdotal and typically used to add texture to a larger collective narrative. Still, their stories are important, and it's through these anecdotes that we build evidence that enslaved girls were capable of resisting their situation as strongly as adults. Furthermore, Minetta's story helps us dismantle the common reaction that we have when we think about a child or a girl of 15 being sent to court for murder. We want to see her as just 15, 
but she was 15. We want to see her as a victim, both of the system and of her grandmother's agenda. What does that, what that does though, is it removes her agency. It dismisses her story and it steals her voice. Manetta's story forces us to ask, what happens when girls find themselves in a situation that forces them into an adulthood at a very early age? What happens when they begin to fight back like Manetta or like Sally? Whether African-born or Creole, enslaved girls throughout the Atlantic world lived in an environment that constantly reinforced their status as chattel, a status that was defined by the nature of their work itself. In fact, youth itself was a battleground of sorts within the Jamaican plantation system with three groups at play, the planter class, the parents, and then the enslaved youth themselves. As planters faced increased abolitionist threats to the slave trade and later slavery itself beginning in around the 1780s, their increased reliance upon enslaved youth in a changing economy, economy will have a profound influence in shaping youth culture and girlhood among the enslaved. <clears throat> but what about enslaved youth? What about enslaved girls? What is it like to grow up enslaved in this environment? Like adults, enslaved youth were expected to work 12 to 15 hour days in the fields, or even longer hours as domestics or apprentices to the enslaved artisans. When their work was slow or imperfect, they were flogged or put into various contraptions designed to torture and humiliate, just like adults. No matter their age, they lived in an environment that commodified and dehumanized them for economic gain just like adults. Moreover, early childhood development within the plantation complex is devoid of any sort of gender specific socialization. Preteen boys and girls will perform the same tasks. They wear the same clothing and they play the same games. As historian Marie Jenkins Schwartz has argued, planters were acutely aware that the formative years of early childhood are crucial to child development which led plantation managers to take an active role in setting age-specific tasks while also attempting to foster loyalty and subservience through a paternalistic agenda. Subsequently, enslaved girls will grow up in an environment where most agreed that they were important players within that environment. As girls transitioned from nursery to field, from child to adult, labor expectations and pressures from above will set a specific tone for the tasks that they perform on a daily basis in order to reinforce that status as chattel and to force them to accept the reality of their situation. Furthermore, those tasks are designed to progressively socialize and acclimate them from their lives as laborers so that they'll work at the same capacity as adults. <clears throat> Even before they entered the fields as laborers by age five, their view from the cloth wraps binding them to their mother's back will give them a glimpse of their own future. They spend their early childhoods in plantation nurseries where they watch their community leave before the sun comes up and come home well after when the sun goes down. After entering the children's gang at age five or six, enslaved girls will pick grass, tend livestock, carry cane husks from the boiling house to the trash, and they'll perform um, other light tasks around the estate. I always get a question about what does picking grass mean? They don't have lawnmowers back then, so they use the children to go out with a ruler and they pick the blades of grass to make sure that the lawn is actually even. So that is their, that's their task. At age eight or nine, they'll transition from the, sec from the children's gang to the second gang while they'll begin to perform more strenuous labor in the field. So they'll leave this not really protective environment but they'll leave this picking grass and carrying trash and stuff and now they're gonna be working in the fields right alongside the adults. So they're not expected to harvest as much as the adults do, but they're working alongside them. So they see exactly what they're expected to do and they learn from the adults. <clears throat> uh, 
By the time they joined, they joined the first gang at the age of 15 or 16, they've already been performing first gang tasks for at least six years. So for six years, they've been performing adult tasks, just not at the same expectation. It was also during this time that a select few of the estates, preteen and teenage girls and boys, will move out of the second gang and into an apprenticeship. So we saw this with Sally and we saw this with Elizabeth Pengelly. As domestics, they'll work 12, 15 hour days in the kitchens, um, preparing food, cooking, cleaning pots, kitchen utensils, learning to do the laundry, and attending their master and mistresses every whim. And a lot of them will be given to children who are either younger than they are or their age, white children, and they'll be trained to become a lady's maid or a personal valet. And those children are encouraged to treat them like dirt. And that's how they learn to be plantation owners. So while contributing to the overall plantation economy as field laborers and domestics, most enslaved girls will also work to the benefit um, of their household economy whenever possible. So we see them selling fruits and crafted items on the roads. Um, we'll see them assisting their households with provision gardens. Every uh, household is given a track of land and they can grow fruits and vegetables there. They do that on Sundays and so the kids will go out there and they'll work that. <clears throat> And sometimes they will accompany enslaved women to the Sunday markets to sell any extra. So while the plantation is impressing their status as slaves, through their work in the fields, the elders in their household are adding various chores and responsibilities to their already heavy workload. Some enslaved girls, however, are taking these responsibilities quite seriously, and they see themselves as sharing the role of family provider, just like the adults. In fact, enslaved youth throughout the Atlantic world will live in an environment that's comparable to an underdeveloped um, or impoverished nation today. So we see throughout archival sources and primary sources instances where enslaved girls and boys are stealing food, crops, sugarcane um, to either consume themselves, give to their family, or sell at roadside and local markets. And although whites on the island are viewing these occurrences as nothing more than juvenile delinquency, I see them more like they're helping out their family. It's also at this preteen and teenage stage, however, that Jamaica's enslaved girls encounter a more complex series of definitions of girlhood that will revolve around the work that they'll perform on the plantations. As abolitionism will gain momentum in the 1780s, there's an increased threat against the slave trade, which means no Africans will be brought in. But unlike here in North America, where the enslaved will produce naturally, there the enslaved die within five to seven years. So they're absolutely dependent upon the slave trade. So if there's no Africans coming in, they are trying to figure out how to rectify that, and girls are gonna be an answer. So we now see new definitions of child and of girl. So enslaved girls and boys who are labeled infants and children aren't working on the estate yet. Uh, girls and boys will be in the gangs, whether the children's gang or the second gang. But now we see titles like woman girl appear. Um, and it's a new categorization of 14 and 15 year old girls who are right on the edge of puberty. So now, girls between the ages of 14 and 15 and eventually 12 and 13 are going to be defined as woman girls and added to a new list in the inventories that lists all of the breeding wenches on the estate. And they also call them belly women. So let me explain what that is to you. The term breeding winches will appear more regularly in the correspondence around this time. Um, before any threat to the slave trade, it really was just a label that was added to a woman to say this is her condition, she's pregnant, she's breeding at the moment. It's a very uncouth 18th century way of saying somebody's pregnant. 
However, by 1807, we start seeing it used more commonly to label reproductive potential. <clears throat> the word breeding still describes pregnancy, but the meaning of the label is going to take on an urgency that we didn't have before. And it's signifying a need and an expectation of the people who are in that list. So by 1807, this is now a solution to the fact that the slave trade is now illegal. And the age of the girls and women who appear in this category will get younger and younger and younger. So now we start seeing this boundary between girlhood and womanhood becoming blurrier and blurrier. And eventually it's going to disappear. <clears throat> so gender will become synonymous with reproductive potential. And age will also be added to that. And so now enslaved girls' responsibilities and the nature of their work will be an expectation of you need to produce children. As these lines between women and girl begin to disappear, enslaved girls are going to find themselves exploited even further by the men who feel that it's their right to take what they feel they own. Thistlewood left us over 14,000 pages of a diary. He lived in Jamaica for 35 years, where most of them will live there, they'll get their fortune, they'll go back after four years, or most of the plantation owners are absentee and they live in Jamaica. I mean, they live in England and they invest in the Caribbean. This would stay because this was an environment that was unchecked. He had no accountability for his actions and this was like a playground for him. Um, so he tells us all kinds of stuff that he did and he's not alone. Um, you see people like Thistlewood not always to his degree within the archives. And so this becomes something that becomes more commonplace. So given their close proximity to their enslavers, um, the girls are really going to be um, unprotected from these men. And so assault is going to become very frequent on these estates. And the girls who are working as domestics are gonna be far more, um, in a far more dangerous position than the girls who are working in the fields because they're always around them. Not only that, but the enslavers are going to allow outside access to their bodies. So if they have friends and visitors who are coming over, they'll say, you go pick somebody out of the, the villages and um, don't pick her because she's my favorite. So they'll sort of leave a mark on somebody, but everyone else is fair game. Already being classified as women girls, and breeding winches and belly women, they are now unable to protect themselves from sexual advances and assaults with alarming regularity. So this becomes so commonplace that the assembly decides they're gonna crack down on it. They want to end assault on the island of young girls. So in 1816, the Jamaican assembly will attempt to protect enslaved girls under the age of 10 from white men by enacting a law that stipulates any carnal knowledge of an enslaved female under the age of 10 is punishable by death. It's not enforced, but the law is there. So when a law like this shows up, you realize that this is so commonplace it now necessitates a law. So that means there's so much of this 10 years old happening that they have now made a law. But what does that mean for the girls who are 11? What does that mean for the girls who are 12? So basically what they've done is they've said, childhood is anything below 10. So you can't have sex with a child, but anybody above 10 is fair game. That is completely within the limits of the law. <clears throat> now, there's no court where a girl can actually press charges. There was an instance that I found where a man in Kingston was taken to court for assaulting a nine-year-old girl in 1820. He argued that the girl was chattel and she had no rights. So he violated this law. <clears throat> 
Since she couldn't testify against him, because that would be illegal, Kingston courts transferred the case to an English court who ruled in favor of the Kingstonian charged with rape. Therefore, although Jamaican law is attempting to recognize some delicacy of youth, however they've defined it, English law still maintained that the enslaved were chattel no matter their age and therefore they had no voice and no rights. And he was not put to death. So that law means nothing. So needless to say, breeding winches and adolescent girls will become a much sought after commodity for a variety of reasons within the Jamaican plantation system. We can only imagine how their experiences will shape and obstruct their psychological development. As we've seen with Sally and quite possibly Minetta, um, there is evidence that they are attempting to take control of their lives as best they can through various acts of resistance and revolt. Uh, enslaved girls will frequently appear before island courts for committing various acts of theft, violence, vandalism, arson, and disturbing the peace. One girl who is about 10 years old named Cuba came before the St. Elizabeth Court for, quote, violent and indecent language in the public street. So basically she's just yelling and screaming horrible things at people. And they took her to court. Then there's the case that's very similar to Minetta involving two sisters named Bessie and Kitty who were found guilty of murder and sentenced to transportation off the island by the St. Anne Courts, which is another parish, in July of 1797 for poisoning their mistress's tea with arsenic. They admitted it. They said, yeah, we did it. And they were transported off the island. So one of the things I want you to think about is why are they selling them and sending them to another place instead of executing them? It's because property, their property. So if you execute them, that means that their owner can then file an insurance claim and be paid for his loss. So enabling him to sell her or the courts then sell these girls or these boys to another place, that enables the courts to earn money and it enables the assembly to earn money. <clears throat> so we also see tons of runaway advertisements listed in newspapers and broadsides throughout the Atlantic world. And we see as many girls as we see boys there. Um, you'll see them listed as absconded, and absconded is just a fancy 18th century word for they ran away. One runaway advertisement that appeared in a Montego Bay um, newspaper in April of 1784 listed a young girl named Nell, who was about six years old, who fled her estate in Montego Bay looking for her mother. So she knew her mother was gone. Either she was sold away from her mother or her mother f fled. And a six-year-old girl went looking for her, and she ran away. Another girl named Harriet, who was sent to the St. George Parish Workhouse in June of 1823, which is kind of like a prison, um, she's listed as having scars on her back and stomach from being flogged so much. And this was an identifying mark. She ran away. So little Nell is refusing to be separated from her mother, but Harriet is likely trying to escape the harsh punishment and labor that she's facing in this workhouse. And then there is a 1779 notice in a publication called the Jamaican Mercury, which involves a runaway man named Raymond, who was harbored by a girl we don't know her age, but it said young girl, aptly named Charity in the parish of St. Anne. So she found this runaway and she was hiding him. And I found another girl named Susanna who in 1822 was charged with aiding and abetting an escaped woman named Nancy, no relation to her, <clears throat> in Port Antonio. So not only are they running away, these girls are helping people run away and they're trying to keep them from being found. So such behavior certainly indicates that they're capable of resisting their situation just as strongly as adults, and it's not unique to the island of Jamaica either. So where historians see agency and resistance, planters see 
primitive behavior, savagery, they feel like they need to get a handle on this. They feel like this is going to threaten the institution of slavery. And now that the slave trade is outlawed, abolitionists have moved their attention to slavery itself. So they are going to enact a plan that will hopefully create a situation that will make it so drastic if, if slavery does come to an end. So what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and control the savagery that they're saying they see among island youth by impressing a program of religious instruction that will stress a Protestant work ethic, Christian conversion, and marriage. So what they're arguing is, is the reason why our enslaved can't reproduce naturally is that they're not married. Because we all know that marriage is the only way that you can get pregnant. That's how stupid they are. So how do girls fit into this plan? And how does this change the nature of girlhood on the island? <clears throat> so they're going to put a special focus on the enslaved girls that they designated breeding winches earlier. <clears throat> so what they're going to hope is that this is going to boost the natural increase on their estate. And they're hoping that religious instruction will make it easier for them to do this. They feel like they'll have proper guidance. They'll have a Christian upbringing. Um, they'll, they'll grow to be a good Christian girl instead of like their mothers who can't get pregnant. Um, and they blame those mothers for keeping Jamaica in the situation that they're in. It has nothing to do with them. It's all the mother's fault. <clears throat> so by 1826, the entire Jamaican enslaved population will have been baptized. They just take an estate full of people and they bring a minister there and they get them all together and they baptize them. So they basically move through an assembly line. They're hoping that we won't have, they won't have economic devastation and they're hoping that they won't have a situation like um, a revolution in San Domingue that led to Haiti and the situation that Haiti is in. So they see this as being preventative action. And they're going to take it a step further and they're going to remove enslaved youth, especially girls, away from their community's influence and they're going to put them in special schools. So this is a big thing that the English will do. They'll do this in Australia with Aboriginal children. We do this with um, indigenous children. Um, after the Civil War, <clears throat> you take them out of that environment, you teach them to speak proper English, you teach them to be good Christian children, and you teach them to be loyal in their adulthood. <clears throat> this will happen to Elizabeth Pengilly. All six of her children will be taken away from her and enrolled in a school away from her estate. So they go to a parish school. They're not even on the estate. As part of the curriculum, Many of the enslaved girls enrolled in these schools will then be recruited as teachers. So when they get an education behind them, these enslaved girls will then go to their, back to their plantations and they will tutor children there who aren't old enough to go to these schools or they'll start a school of their own. And they'll teach them as like a missionary would. So in 1828, for example, um, the St. Catherine Parish Vestry will establish a school in Spanish Town, and then you'll see that being used as a model through all of the parishes across the island. So while we've already seen enslaved girls becoming these economic investments to the plantation economy as workers and later as breeding winches, now they're going to attach a social value to their work. So despite the fact that their evolution into civilized or moral commodities still attaches enslaved girls to the viability of the Jamaican plantation economy, their girls, the girls' roles on the island will shift their identity from slave to future freed woman. 
So the education of these girls will actually begin to define freedom on the island because this is a plan of what's going to happen to this community once we can no longer enslave them. So they're hoping to keep them as loyal workers and the girls are the ones who are going to be responsible for this because not only are they going to be teaching these children, but when they have children of their own, they'll be putting those values onto them. In 1833, Parliament will pass a law that abolishes slavery in all British dominions. So this is the thing that they've been waiting on. Rather than give immediate freedom to the enslaved, they feel that they can't handle immediate freedom. So we're going to put them all into an apprenticeship system that will teach them how to be free. Really what this is, is this is a way to keep them tied to the estates longer so that they can work on their economy so it won't be so devastating when it's over. Any child below the age of six will be free. Any child born after 1834, which is when this law goes into effect, will be born free. Anyone seven and older will be an apprentice. And England will grant 20 million pounds sterling as compensation to be divided among planters for their losses. So not reparations for the enslaved, but more reparations for the enslavers. And you can ask for more if you need it, and they'll give it. So what's going to happen to the enslaved girls that we've been talking about? Jamaican planters and estate managers are immediately going to attack the situation by reorganizing and reinforcing the labor on their estates. So all girls age six and older will continue laboring in the fields from sunup to sundown as they had always done, while most enslaved girls working and apprenticing as domestics will be sent back into the fields. They don't need them working in the great house, they need them in the sugar estates and in the sugar fields. Under slavery, their in entrance into the workforce rapidly transitioned enslaved girls to adulthood when they entered the fields. But they had begun fulfilling an investment potential by the time they entered those fields, and puberty made them more profitable. None of that matters anymore. They don't care about that. What they want is for you to be a worker. So no more breeding winches, no more incentives, none of that. They want them in the fields working. As girls below the age of six suddenly become worthless in the eyes of the planter class, girls between the ages of six and 15 will suffer even more because they are going to be instant adults. The nature of girlhood will become age specific. So girls will be below the age of six. Girls above the age of six will be women because they're working at the capacity of adults. None of this graduated stuff that we had before. As older laborers die, a new generation won't be there to replace them. So anything that we had below that, none of that is important to them. So apprenticeship is going to allow these girls to become women in their own time because they'll be merely classified as apprentices. It doesn't stop planters from continuing their socialization efforts, though, because they still worry about how are we going to control that free population after we don't have them tied to the estates anymore? So the way that they're going to do this is they're going to expand the education programs that they had before, and they're going to build more and more schools. And England is actually going to give them an additional 25,000 pounds sterling for this purpose. And if you need more, you can get more. But now what's going to happen is that the girls who were teachers won't be teachers anymore. That's going to be missionaries and that's going to be men, white men, who will come to the island specifically for that purpose. So that thing that you had where you could have this job is now being taken away from you. <clears throat> so the other thing that's going to happen is it's going to create a loophole to the apprenticeship laws because those kids that go into these schools will not just be learning and education and the curriculum that was there. They're also going to be performing duties on the estate because they want to teach them a trade. So they're working even though they're not supposed to be working. <clears throat> 
To ensure that more free children are going to enter the schools, planters will offer incentives and use education as a bargaining chip with their apprentices. So any extra time that they work will help pay their children's education. And parents actually want their children to go into these schools. They don't understand that they're also doing work on the estates, but they see their children as hope. And they see these girls as girls who can grow up to be a girl with an education instead of the work potential and the expectations of her reproduction that we had before. And so where we had in 1834 only about 8,000 children who were enrolled in school, in 1838, when apprenticeship ends, there's 38,899 free children who are on the island 98% of those children are enrolled in school. So it's going to jump, I mean skyrocket, to where these kids, all kids, are going into school. So it creates this opportunity for a sharp increase in education for Jamaican girls. And notice I'm calling them Jamaican girls because that's where we are now. Now these girls are going to be creating this Jamaican identity because they're no longer enslaved. Now they have an identity that they can create themselves. And so it's going to establish an environment that's going to allow them to have opportunities that they wouldn't have had before. Unfortunately, we're going to have a lot of challenges to what they learn at home. So you'll see this dual identity where they learn things at home versus what they learn at school. And they're trying to uphold that as best as they can. Um, and we see them succeeding in it because they have one thing that they do in front of white people and one thing that they do at home. So whether Jamaican planners truly believe that they had succeeded in their goals is irrelevant. I don't care. What's important, however, is that they had become to view youth culture, and more specifically girlhood, as a viable economic investment. Enslaved girls were no longer just a means of production. They're moral commodities. They're a means of protecting a, a life that was, they felt was in crisis. So as more responsibility is being put on enslaved girls and apprentices, to lead them towards an economic stability and profitability that they need after emancipation, girlhood is going to become this rush process for these girls. They'll move from gang to gang, from field labor to domestic, from educated to educator. We see them negotiating that place every time they move from one thing to another, every time they're being um, expected to be one thing or expected to be another thing, we see them negotiating that place at every possibility. What we see in this is that everything that we came to know about gender, uh, we need to question that. Um, because now we see girls operating in that environment where previously we saw women. We see girls being treated as women and we have to question how much agency does a girl have over what we expected a woman to have before. So let's turn back to the girls that I first introduced you to at the start of this lecture. Um, Sally and Minetta's stories are gonna challenge that traditional narrative because they're girls who are refusing to accept their status. And it brings into question everything that we thought before. It adds complexity, it adds texture, it adds a whole new dimension to what we thought about gender roles, about resistance, about youth. Elizabeth Pingulli's story, first as an enslaved girl and then the mother of enslaved girls, enables us to gain a more detailed picture of how girlhood and slavery will change over time and how girlhood will change from slavery through apprenticeship and then finally through the post-emancipation period. As she is her ch and her children navigate that transition from slavery to freedom, we see girlhood returning to its early 18th century status as a liability, but Elizabeth's children and her girls will face a prospect of an undefined childhood after apprenticeship. Her daughters will have an opportunity to experience a girlhood outside of slavery and to work and to grow as girls, as Jamaicans. That excitement that we feel about that is sobered 
by the mysteries surrounding Molly and Minetta's stories, reminding us that we still have a lot of work to do. We don't know a lot about Molly outside of her father's name or the fact that she was owned by the Clarendon Vestry. We don't know what her mother's name was. We don't know how she came to be owned by the vestry. We don't even know what the nature of her work was there. We just know that she petitioned for her freedom once, it didn't work out, and then 30 years later it did. That's all we know. Yet we do have clues, and with those we can try to construct her life history as best we can by asking more of our sources. Still, like Sally, we do see agency and we hear her voice, and we can share what we know as a start. So, despite our efforts to bring these girls out of the periphery, we still continue to find ourselves piecing together snippets of girlhoods. And what we end up with is a collective identity. So even though I have these four girls that I've been researching and I'm trying to piece together their stories, it's really hard. And we really just have this shared experience by girls who are moving through this process. Molly and Minetta will undoubtedly become part of a larger history alongside Sally and Elizabeth. I have no idea if I'm gonna find anything else about them. I'm still looking. I was on leave last semester and I found some stuff, but I also spent a lot of time looking through sources where I didn't find anything. So while Sally's story is an anomaly within the archives, we keep looking. We have a good idea of the nature of their work. We have a sufficient picture of the conditions in which they lived. We know how their girlhoods changed and how they resisted the situations that they're in. But we still need to keep looking, and that's our responsibility as historians. Thank you.